It is almost June, so I figured why not do a garden tour to celebrate this spring to summer transition, especially here in San Diego, where as you can see around me, I'm surrounded by gray because we have the May gray season. Then we have the June gloom season, which is an extension of that. And in July, we finally had summer. So what that means is that my plants look really good right now, but soon they're going to be covered in powdery mildew due to all this gray and extra, extra moisture from all this kind of ocean air blowing in. So let's do a quick tour, show you how nice everything looks before that kind of powdery moldy season sets in. We're going to start over here with these tomatoes. These are the first tomatoes I planted in the garden this year, and they're all being grown on a string trellis system. This is really nice for the early season production because by training it to only have one liter, and what that means is I'm removing suckers as they appear, it's focusing all of its energy on producing the fruit that it has instead of trying to bush out and grow more vegetatively. The other thing it does is it promotes a lot of this airflow, which helps me out during this May gray season. So that's why these look the way they do, but I have a few different ways of growing tomatoes around the garden. So we'll definitely talk more about that as we work our way through. Now over here, I have my kale plant, which was entirely covered in aphids probably about two months ago. I did a full reset by pruning it back and spraying it very heavily with just plain old water. And now it looks absolutely wonderful. So I'm very pleased to see that it totally bounced back without using any pesticide. Now, working our way down, we have these carrots here. So these are carrots that have gone to flower. And I'm kind of letting them flower because the flowers look really, really nice. The, a lot of the pollinators really enjoy using them. And they already started. So at this point, the carrot is going to have a hard center that's not very palatable. So I'd rather just let them flower, complete the cycle, and then I'll plant something else in their place when they're done. Now on my right is actually probably the healthiest looking zucchini plant that I've ever grown. Nice little, uh, I believe, Emerald Delight summer squash. And the plant looks really wonderful. It's very open, not very dense and spiny. So it's very easy to find the squash and also to harvest them. All right, that's enough summer squash talk for one day. So let's work our way back to the front of the garden where I have my first herb bed. This is kind of the first thing we put in the garden and it's kind of the primary herbs that we use on a daily basis. I want them as close to the kitchen as possible. So I have my marjoram, thyme, winter savory, rosemary, dill, sage, a bunch of garlic chives. And then over here I actually have a hollyhock. This is a perennial flower and it actually just started flowering nice and early for the season. And this year we got so much rain that this hollyhock is absolutely exploding with growth. Every single stalk is covered in hundreds of these little flower buds. So I know it's going to be an extremely profusive bloom this year. Now to my left are my determinate tomatoes. These are tomatoes that are determinate, meaning that they are determined to grow for a certain period of time and then they're done. They usually don't get any bigger than like three to four feet. They set all their fruit at once and then the plant dies. So in terms of trellising, you don't need to do anything complex like doing a string trellis or anything really beyond that. All you have to do is basically keep them upright so that they could get to their fruiting cycle and that's it. So what I have here are six wooden stakes and as they grow taller, I just keep wrapping string around. And the only thing this is really trying to do is keep the tomatoes inside this bed. I'm not trying to do anything more than that because I don't care. They're determinant. Once they're harvested, they're out of here. So I actually have the full explanation in my vlog that I just posted if you guys want to see more on that. But as we work our way back here, you'll see my flame seedless grape is looking very healthy, very full. It's got a ton of little fruit clusters, which I'm going to decide which ones I want to prune back or not. Actually, this one I'll just remove because it looks weird. So these are the little immature baby fruits and or flowers, I guess, before they turn to fruit. And so at some point I will prune back some of them because I'm going to thin my grapes this year. I don't want to just let them all go crazy because then we'll get a bunch of grapes that just don't taste that incredible. I'd rather have a bunch of incredible tasting grapes instead of a, you know, a whole lot of mediocre grapes, I guess. <laughs> um, but nothing's mediocre from the garden. It is always better. So, you know, that's true. Now, this guy over here is my cucumber trellis. So this is a very simple build, two tree stakes and a two by two strapped across the top with a net interstrung around it. So what's going on here is I have one, two, three, four, five cucumbers and they've actually just started flowering. So the season has begun. I will be getting cucumbers quite soon here and they have actually also reached the trellis net. So once they get on this, it's game over. They're gonna just take over and shoot all the way up. I'm very excited to see that happen. And behind the cucumbers is a giant Shasta daisy and a giant borage, which I'll probably need to cut back because they are hogging a little bit of light here. So now let's go take a look in that area because actually where I have a sad little problem of garlic rust. So as I mentioned earlier, we did get a lot of rain this year, which has been really great. I'm very pleased that we got that a net positive on that fact but the thing that sucks is that it created 
a bunch of garlic rust. This is especially prevalent here in San Diego where we plant earlier than most people because we don't really have a winter. And so what happened is I got a bunch of rust on my garlic. This is a fungal disease, causes the bulbs to get stunted in their growth and they don't actually really form full bulbs. Now, one of them, by some stroke of luck, did actually grow to be quite massive and form a proper bulb, which I'm very pleased about. But for the most part, they're all like this, they're stunted. They're not really very curable because they don't actually have much of a garlic clove in there. So it's a very unfortunate event and it lives in the soil for about two to three years. So I am actually thinking of removing all of this just to get that process started as soon as possible before it gets too bad. But I do want more of these, so it's a tough decision. Now to my left is my grafted tomato. So I have a couple grafted tomatoes. This is the one that made it. The first one that I put in the ground here actually got knocked over by a bird who decided to sit on top of it and break the stem. So that's why I have this wire net over it. But it is growing. It has put out a couple new nodes. So I am confident that it took. And we have one more grafted tomato in the other garden, which we'll take a look at later. Now, I did want to show you guys my other trellis setup over here on the tomatoes as well as a chop and drop bed that I just set up. If you guys have seen my previous tours, you might be familiar with the fact that this is where I had my overwintered perennial eggplants for actually over two years now. But this year, due to all that rain, they did die. And so it's unfortunate, but it's a good time to practice crop rotation. I could put my eggplants somewhere else. And I also had a bunch of fava beans growing here. So what I did is I chopped up the fava beans using that shovel behind me, piled them up in here with a little bit of compost to give it a kickstart and already it's rotting quite substantially. So this is now being returned into nutrients to the soil. I've covered it with straw to help provide a brown to essentially compost in place. And then the last thing I do is I cover it in burlap so that all those little detritivores, roly polies, can eat all day long instead of hiding from the sun. Probably in a week, this whole bed will be ready to be planted and it's only been set up like this for one week. So about two week turnaround time on the chop and drop. And I'm excited to see how much I could get out of this with all this extra fertility. The left side is my other tomato trellis. So I have quite a few different ways of trellising tomatoes. This is one that um, I have done before, but this material itself is new to me. This is a jute twine trellis setup. The really cool thing about this is that A, it's not plastic, and B, that means it's entirely compostable. So what that means is that if this entire thing gets covered in tomatoes, I could just cut this whole thing down, throw it in the compost, and it's totally fine. I don't have to worry about plastic or anything like that. And the nice thing about this setup as well is that unlike the string, we only have really one option to support something. Any one of these little trellis sections can actually support a tomato branch. So I could let these go pretty wild, almost like a Florida weave. So that's it for this garden. Let's go take a look at one of my container sections and move our way through that part of the garden. So now we're over here in my main container section where I have a lot of vegetables, but also quite a few fruit trees. So these two right here are persimmons. I also have a pomegranate, two guavas, a banana, Barbados cherry, and a lot of figs. That's just one of them. As I work my way down, what you'll see are a couple plants that I try growing every year, even though they don't do particularly well in my climate. It's just not hot enough. One of those is peanuts, which I buy from the nursery every year just to play with. It's a fun plant to grow. I also have a ginger here, which is under a little humidity dome to act as a kind of greenhouse. Both of these plants love heat, and San Diego just doesn't provide enough of it. Now this guy here is one that I wanted to highlight because it's the Space Master 80 cucumber. That's a cucumber that only gets like two to three, tall, two to three feet tall, it gets very bushy, it's extremely prolific. Definitely the best cucumber for containers that I found. Highly recommended if you guys are looking to grow cucumbers in a container. Now as we work our way over here, you see more of the traditional vegetables. I have tomatoes in all sorts of container sizes, different trellis setups. But I also want to draw your attention to these two over here. So just for comparison, this is an eggplant that I started from seed this year, and it's actually looking really well. Like I'm very pleased with how it looks, very healthy, vigorous, but this one is one that I overwintered. So I just cut it back severely and let it regrow from last year. And it's obviously a lot more big, and it also even has flowers for me. So I will be actually harvesting eggplant pretty soon off this. And that's one of the advantages of trying to overwinter or perennialize some of these plants. Another good example are peppers. This is a scotch bonnet, so a spicy hot pepper. Hot peppers usually take a very long time to actually start producing, but if you overwinter it like this one here, you'll already get flowers when you're not even in June. So I'm very pleased with this result as well. And the other one that I'm very pleased about is this right here, which I've tried growing, I think three times now. This is the Clancy potato. It is a potato that's literally grown from a true seed. So it's not propagated from another potato. 
It's actually a seed that you plant and then you could transplant later on. So I'm very curious to see how they are because if this tastes good, I'm very excited to have a seed of a potato that I could just grow whenever I want. Um, one last thing in this section before we move over to the garden is this guy right here. So this is a sweet potato that I started from slips. You might have seen my short form on how to grow those slips. But what I'm doing is I'm growing it in a big container and I'm trellising it up. The idea behind this is that the vines will work their way up. I could even bury it with straw if I want more potatoes to produce in there. But that way I'll get tons of potential energy from the green growth going up and that'll concentrate all the power into the roots down below so I could get a ton of sweet potatoes from a small container. Now that's enough for containers in this section. So let's pop over into the garden over there because I have quite a few different things to show you there. Now we're over here in the north garden where I have my other grafted tomatoes. I mentioned earlier, this guy down here is another graft and it's the delicious hunt variety. That's the one that I grew last year that almost hit three pounds. So I'm hoping with some grafted genetics I could get up and over that three pound limit. And this is my beautiful little handiwork here. <laughs> It's a kind of sketchy looking wooden tomato trellis, but I think it will last. I think it will hold. I wanted to build something extra big for this extra big tomato. So let's work our way down to this side of the garden, which is much more planted out, starting with this no-till bed, which actually isn't planted out. But what I have here in front of me are a bunch of different sort of uh, winter squash, pumpkins, watermelons, things like that which I'm going to plant here and let them kind of ramble and go crazy in this little area. Now behind me is what you guys probably remembered as my gigantic teepee trellis full of passion fruit. Now the passion fruit did come out. We decided that we don't need a whole nother section of passion fruit because we have quite a bit over in the chicken run area. So instead we've returned it back to its original origins of growing um, climbing vegetables. So right here I have my center cut squash which is actually my favorite eating squash, is a type of summer squash and it's already growing quite nicely. I see a lot of little flowers on the way. So I'm very excited to have this entire trellis covered in squash and beans because we love eating squash and beans here at home. So to my left is my other section of tomatoes. You'll probably see a recurring theme that I have tomatoes scattered everywhere in the garden because they are my absolute favorite thing to grow and eat all the time. So on this side, I have my bigger tomatoes. These are my large slicers, beef steaks. Things like the Delicious Hunt, the Cherokee Purple, Cherokee Carbon, anything that's a more sizable tomato, I have on this side. I also have, what you'll see here, are these two white caterpillar tunnels that I built using just 12 gauge wire that I bent into hoops. Underneath that is actually a bunch of peppers. So let me show you one of them over here. I just pull this kern back and you'll see that I have my peppers growing quite nicely in there. The idea behind this is that, as I mentioned earlier, we do have May Gray, which means that it's pretty cold at the beginning of the season. And what this does is it creates a miniature greenhouse effect and it traps all the heat in here, allowing these peppers to thrive while the spring is still quite cold, at least here in San Diego. So that's why they're covered up. This is a breathable material. Water can come in, air can come out, totally permeable, which means that it's not gonna really overheat too much. So I'm not too worried about that. Now, behind me, I have another Florida weave. These are all my cherry tomatoes. They are smaller fruited, which means they don't need as much sun as something like these bigger tomatoes. So as these grow bigger, they'll cast a little bit of shadow this way, which is totally fine for these guys. But the big tomatoes need every bit of sun that they could get. Now let's work our way over to the, behind this gigantic flower patch. You'll see I have more of these Chima Family Farm poppies, a bunch of amazing gray poppies and sweet peas. So just kind of a nice little pop of color at the beginning of the garden. Now, you'll also probably be wondering how my bare root strawberries are doing in the green stock, and they're actually doing pretty well. Now, some of them I did over water, or over water, because I did not expect this May Gray to come in as violently as it did. And so some of these cells got a little bit too wet, and I have a couple that are dying back or not looking too happy. But overall, they're actually taking quite nicely, and they're starting to really try to produce fruit. So I have removed some of these early fruits, like this guy here, but I am willing to let them try to start fruiting now because I do want to actually eat a strawberry. This is eventually going to be a full three sisters garden. So it's going to have the corn, the beans, and probably squash growing throughout it. The variety of corn here is Martian Jewel, and I have each corn planted about six inches apart from plant to plant. And in row, it's closer to about maybe 10 to 12 inches in row spacing. So very densely planted, and the outer rim is going to be entirely planted in beans. And then everything throughout here is going to be rambling with squash vines. Now on the other side of me over here, I actually have my onion bed, which did sort of so-so. Um, I think they just got blocked off from too much sun by all the brassicas I had growing in front of them. 
But here's one of my yellow Granex. It looks quite nice. The neck has flopped over, which means it's ready for harvest. And honestly, I wish I got a bigger one, but that's probably the biggest idea I'm getting this year. Kevin has some that are maybe two to three times the size. So he definitely has me beat on onions this year. But I wanted to show you guys my root, root stout potato bed. So this is something that I'm probably going to harvest this week because it's looking very sad and dead. But let me just show you what it looks like. So there we are. Whew. So down here, loaded with potatoes. These are just growing on the surface of the soil underneath all the straw. So I can just come in here and actually you can still see it's attached to the plant right here. You could snap that off. And there's a nice Sarpomira potato. This is now a young potato. I could eat this whenever I want, but man, it feels nice and firm. It's going to be very tasty. I'm very much looking forward to harvesting all these. And actually, speaking of potatoes, let me put this guy with the onion, right behind me in my L-shaped bed, I actually planted another round of potatoes. Might strike you as kind of odd considering summer is on its way, but the El Nino prediction for this year, kind of like the climate prediction for the San Diego region, is that we're going to have a colder start to the summer. So it's not gonna get as hot, it's going to be below average temperatures. So I decided to play with that information. I'm going to plant more potatoes and ride that colder period out, get a second harvest of potatoes. Instead of putting a bunch of heat loving crops in, they're just going to not do that well in this colder start of the year. I also actually have a cauliflower here, a sprouting cauliflower that is just about ready to be harvested. So I did mention earlier that I have a second patch of garlic that's looking much healthier. So let's go over to the front yard and take a look at that right now. Up here, we are in the front yard now, and you can see that the garlic is looking a lot better than that other section. Much more green, much deeper color, and there's not a huge amount of rust. I did notice that there is some rust, which means that I also won't be able to grow garlic now in my front yard for at least two years. But I want to pull one of these just to show you guys what it sort of looks like when the garlic is developing properly. They're not... Ugh quite done yet, which is why they're small. But see here how the neck is pinching down and then bulbing out? That's the normal progression of garlic. You don't want it to just form a weird thick neck all the way down because it's probably meaning that it's not going to bulb. Now, the way you could tell when this is done would be like when these leaves were fully brown, I would consider that ready to harvest because at least 50% of the leaves are now green, or sorry, brown. So yeah, normal garlic right here. I'll snack on this whole thing later because you can actually eat the outer peel of garlic when it's fresh. So this right here is totally edible. It's not all hard and papery. But that's it for the tour today, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I wish you guys luck to avoid the powdery moldy season that I know is coming from my garden right now.